This is my country, my damn country. Give me my country, you can keep the rest. This is my country, my damn country. And it don't mean a thing if you don't pass the test. If you ain't never cheated or been cheated on, then take off your boots, you rhinestone fraud. High school memories. This is my country, my damn country. Give me my country, you can keep the rest. This is my country, my damn country. And it don't mean a thing if it don't pass the test. If you ain't never spent a single night in jail, then get another job and I'll see you in hell. I'm drawn like a moth through the neon lights. I need a bucket of beer and someone to fight. Don't call yourself country if your music is shitty. Or this Carolina boy will take you down to Fifth City. You know who you are, I ain't gonna name names. Your hands off my country and go back from where you came. My country, my damn country, give me my country, you can keep the rest. This is my country, my damn country, and it don't mean a thing if it don't pass the test. If you ain't never done something you regret, well then I'm proud of you. And now get <laughs> Welcome, fight fans. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon and Boxing. I am your host, Jeff, and today we are going to talk uh, about last week's fights, of course, uh, some boxing news from this week, and uh, let's call this show Fury's Fury. Seems to be able to do whatever he wants in this sport. I mean, I guess that's what happens when you're that good, but let's start with introducing what I'm drinking on the show tonight. This is one of my favorites, man. This is called a fistful of bourbon. Uh, The price is really good on it. You get it for about $24.99. Not a bad price. Uh, It's really good and smooth, man. I like it a lot. Kind of compared to Eliza Craig a little bit. It's got that kind of, uh, you know, smoothness to it. But, you know, like we like to do, we like to start our show off with a shot and then we'll jump into what happened last week. And the fights from then, and uh, let's pour ourselves a shot. All right, let's take this shot. Toast to the show, Bourbon and Boxing, Episode Three: Fury, Fury's Fury. Here we go, guys. All right, man, let's jump into it. Uh, Last week we had some uh, good fights going on. Some really good undercards on the zone with the uh, Schofield versus uh, Rhodes fight. Uh, Schofield versus Rhodes, I should say. But I want to start out with the uh, Boots Ennis versus uh, Romaine uh, Villa fight. And how that fight went, man. In my opinion, Boots absolutely dominated it. He took his time getting into it, uh, kind of took a few rounds to kind of fill uh, Villa out, I guess, to really kind of test the power that uh, Villa has and uh, see what he was going to bring to the table. Once Boots figured that out, uh, I'd have to say pretty much he dominated. He became the stalker, the more aggressive fighter, backing uh, Villa down and just uh, daring him to throw those big punches. And every time he thought about it, he would counter and uh, just absolutely tore him up. It was an incredible showing for Boots. Uh, if you want to send a message to the rest of the welterweight that you're no longer, you know, a prospect, you're no longer that that guy that is the future of the welterweight. You're asking right now. You want it now, and uh, I think he could definitely compete against a Crawford or a Spence. Not saying he could beat him, but he could definitely compete. He's on that level. And uh, I'd love to see <clears throat> Showtime and PBC get together and make that Stan Onis fight happen while we wait for the two-fight deal uh, to be done between Crawford and Spence, which uh, Crawford was saying that he thinks both of those fights will happen this year. I think if you're the promoters of that, you want to put one this year, 
And then if it's a really good one uh, on July 30th or 29th, if it's a really good one, then you build that up for the beginning of next year. Start out boxing with that fight starting out the year with uh, Spence Crawford 2. But I think in the meantime, you have to put uh, Boots and Stanonis in a ring together. You Showtime has both of these guys. It shouldn't be hard to make that fight. And uh, I think it would be a really good fight. And then we could really determine who is next in line uh, for the winner of Spence and Crawford in that welterweight division. But I think overall, Boots just really put on a hell of a show. <clears throat> Saturday against Villa, who is a top ranked. He's a, he's a top 10 guy uh, in the welterweight. So it's not like he fought a chump. Everybody said he's a standstill fighter. Villa was. Uh, he didn't have much chance to stand still, to be honest with you, because Boots was very aggressive coming at him, bringing the pressure to him. So he really didn't have time to set still uh, and try to set up that big punch that he likes to land. So hats off the Boots for one going in there against a good fighter like Villa despite what people say flat-footed or try to take away from anything they can from a Boots win in this fight, uh, which I don't know why he would. I don't understand the hate uh, on Boots, honestly. Uh, and he really showed out in this fight. And uh, I thought he put on a hell of a performance and really kind of set that tone in the welterweight to say, hey, I'm next, man. I want these. I want the big guys. I want Crawford Spence. I want a chance at those titles, and I want a chance uh, to show that I am the best in the welterweight. Uh, hats off the boots. That was a hell of a fight for him. The undercards on that. Now, I didn't really watch much of the undercard on that uh, Showtime event because I was busy watching the uh, the zone fights, which I thought put on a better uh, fight card, in my opinion. And that's nothing against. Uh, Showtime and those guys have fought, but uh, I mean, on the undercard on that, looks like you had uh, Eric Candino, uh, or Yeri Candino defeated William Townsend uh, via first round TKO. Steven Torres defeated James Evans, third round TKO. Uh, Dwight uh, Fleming Jr. defeated Henry Rivera. Uh, via third round TKO and then Ishmael Muhammad defeated Parker uh, Bruno in a third round TKO. So a lot of early, uh, not a lot of uh, and that's could have been why I felt like they uh, were taking a little bit longer to get to that Ennis fight. It looks like all those undercards happened pretty fast and they didn't start that fight till like 925. Uh, but, you know, let's get over to the zone fight. Floyd Schofield versus Haskell Rhodes was another dominating performance by uh, Schofield, knocking Rhodes down three times and uh, putting the getting the unanimous decision. Uh, I really like what I saw from Schofield, nice lightweight contender, and when given the chance to shine, I mean, he was given that opportunity with the uh, Ortiz fight going down the way it did. Uh, and he got that opportunity to step up to that main card role, and he really showed out. He dis he didn't disappoint. He put on a good show. I thought that fight could have been stopped, uh, and uh, around the seventh, around the sixth, seventh round, uh, because Scopo was just putting a beating on Rhodes and uh, knocked him down three times. And I really thought that could have been fought or could have been stopped, but they continued to let the fight happen. And of course it was a unanimous decision for uh, Schofield who took the opportunity on the big stage to showcase what he had and show everybody who he was and kind of get his name more out there in the boxing world uh, for people to look out for him in that division. Uh, of course, on the undercard of that, man, I loved it. I uh, got to see Jojo Diaz back in action, which I absolutely loved. Uh, and uh, he, you know, seeing Jojo back in the ring, uh, it's been a while. He took a couple losses. He was coming off uh, some bad losses, and he looked really good. His footwork, his combinations, uh, he absolutely dominated the fight uh, against his opponent, Jerry Perez. And uh, it went all 10 rounds. With JoJo getting the uh, decision, a unanimous decision, uh, but he absolutely dominated the fight. Showed great stamina, footwork, fast hands, great combination, and looked really good for a guy coming off a couple losses. Uh, looks like it didn't mess with his confidence at all. 
and that this fight coming in was a good fight for him to come back to. Uh, you didn't want to go take another big name opponent and take another chance at taking an early loss in your career again, man. Uh, but great showing on his part. Looked really good. Looked really in shape. Uh, almost didn't recognize him. Uh, and I actually didn't know he was on the uh, the zone undercard. Uh, <clears throat> and I don't know if he came in as a fill-in or what it was, but he obviously looked like he was definitely prepared. He'd been training uh, he hadn't been sitting around moping over his losses. He's back in there, uh, putting the work in. Looked really, really good, man. Uh, almost unrecognizable in there. So, uh, shout out to JoJo. Good comeback win for you, buddy. Uh, was a nice performance. You dominated and uh, got to the uh, unanimous decision. Now, also on that card, uh, the fight that I was really, I mean, Super impressed with, uh, I was looking forward to this fight, honestly. It was a good women's fight. Marlene Esper Esperanza versus Gabriela Alaniz. Uh, man, and I'll tell you what, the speed of uh, Marlene and her head movement and her footwork and her combination she was putting together, she was super, super impressive, man. Uh not taking anything away from Elanese. She got the uh, majority decision. Uh, Esperanza, Esperanza did. And I'll tell you what, man. I was just super impressed with how she fought. And just to see the development of the women's boxing. Uh, what I've watched in the last three, four, uh, five years, really. Uh, just the difference in the athleticism of these girls. Marlena, she doesn't look like she should move like that uh she's lower to the ground she's kind of wide and not saying she's big or nothing like that but she's just kind of wide built uh and short to the ground but the way she moves she moves like a like a like a you know she is small but she just she moves really well uh for her build and she doesn't look like she she's gonna move like that always impressed when i when i watch her but super impressed in this fight and uh, she really looked apart and uh, liked what I saw from her on the women's side. Uh, the zone, uh, I think it was Oscar, was talking a lot of uh, shit about uh, Eddie Hearns not putting together, you know, good cards. And this week was one of those. If the zone would have had uh, the, uh, you know, Oscar Val Valdez or Oscar, uh, goddamn, not Oscar Valdez. Damn it. I'm drawing a blank on who the main card was supposed to be. Virgil Ortiz and Stan Ionis. If they would have had that fight as their main card, uh, the Schofield fight underneath that, the Marlena fight underneath that, and Jojo Diaz on the card, I'm sorry. That might have been uh, one of the best cards of the year uh, from top to bottom uh, put together by Hearns. Uh, so, you know, Oscar talked that shit. How about giving some respect for still pulling off a hell of a card with Jojo Diaz on it and Marlene still on that card and Schofield put on a hell of a show stepping up into the main card to really take over and put on a show and kind of save that uh, save that card overall. Uh, like I said, great great job by DeZone and Hearns. That that card had my attention most of the uh, most of the night. So, like I said, that stopped me from really watching a lot of the uh, Showtime undercard, which I was watching, but not really. I was watching more of the uh, DAZN card. Uh, I didn't catch the other fights that were on that night uh, at all. They had a Friday night fight, and uh, let's see who that was on Friday night. Going into my notes. Oh, man, I'm all the way down there. Yeah, you had Eric Tudor get a unanimous decision against Reggie Harris Jr. That was on the undercard also. That was uh, one of the first fights on the, the zone card. Uh, Friday night, you had a super middleweight fight. Diego uh, Pacheco versus Emmanuel Galagos. Uh, I heard Diego Pacheco uh, won with a big fourth-round knockout. Uh, big talk about him being a world champion contender, according to what Hearns is saying. Or not Hearns, uh... His trainer was saying that he's his promoter. Pretty much, he's got a good chance of uh, being a world champion one day. Uh, also, Saturday showcased a super bannerweight fight with uh, Luis Neri. 
uh, former champion in uh, versus uh, Roland Sal- Salador, with uh, Neri getting a quick uh, knockout in the uh, in the second round over Salador. Uh, really couldn't uh, see what what he's doing, but uh, I mean, nice little win for him. Uh, but. Outside of that, uh, last week I thought there were some good fights. Like I said, uh, the zone put on the best card. You had a Friday night fight, kind of led you into Saturday for an all-day event. Uh, most of the fights were over on this side in the state, so they all kind of conflicted with each other, and I didn't have an opportunity to watch all of them. Uh, don't have enough TVs, and my kids probably wouldn't like if Dad put on boxing on every TV in the house. They'd be pretty pissed off at me. Uh, before we get into some boxing news, uh, quite a bit of news this week in boxing, in my opinion. Uh, let's take another shot. Once again, what I'm drinking on tonight, Fistful Bourbon. Tell me what you're drinking on tonight. And uh, remember, drink responsibly too, man. Don't be an idiot out there drinking and driving. Uh, be an idiot like me and drink in your basement. In a weird room. No, I've slowly made it less weird. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, all right, man, let's take this shot before we get into some boxing news this week, which we do have a lot. Take it out. Shot. Ah. Yeah, I like to chase it, man. I don't really... I mean, I like it, but I, I got to have something to chase it with. Uh, everybody drinks it different. Uh, that's how I like to drink it, man. Don't judge me, man. Not here to be judged, man. I'm here to do a boxing show. Now, I don't want to get my macho man on, man. Don't make me do it. But uh, let's jump into this boxing news. Also, hey, hey, news on my part. I got some cool equipment coming uh, to update my pod. Uh, and show a little bit. I'm going to have a new mic uh, coming in with a new mic boom stand. Uh, a couple of little things that I can add to the show. A little uh, control board that I can add some uh, definition to the show. I guess, you know, sounds, different things like that. Uh, so that's going to be pretty cool on my part. That should be here Tuesday and ready for next week's show. Uh, so that that would be pretty cool when that happens. I'm also hoping to get... The new camera, uh, and that way you can see my ugly ass a little bit more better. Uh, it might uh, scare you away from the show, but uh, maybe I just keep it at the normal. You don't need to really see this in 4K. But, you know, it's worth bringing in and doing. And then I'll be doing a little construction to my uh, room here to try to uh, open up a wall to where I could basically make and uh, put a couple chairs in and get a little bit more comfortable when I do my show, Boxing and Bourbon. Uh, Stuck in this tall chair because it's a tall work table and uh, a smaller relaxing chair doesn't work if I'm all the way down and you see the... It looks stupid. Anyways, I don't need to explain it to you guys. But anyways, uh, that's news on my part. Just getting some new podcast stuff to uh, update the show with some better sound and better quality uh, coming up hopefully by the next show on episode 4. And uh, anyways, let's get into the boxing news of the week. Of course, the big news is that Fury has signed on to to fight in a way. Uh, They're going to fight in Saudi Arabia. Now, initially hearing this You know, I'm like, man, come on, the WBO, you guys got to strip this guy of his title. Uh, You know, he's not fighting Usyk. He's going to go fight this side. You know, he's going to go fight in a way for like a sideshow match and uh, rob us boxing fans of a unified champion uh, for at least another year. I don't think that fight happens at all. But, you know, then I'm like... uh, He's correct. Fury came out and said, look, I don't have a mandatory. I offered these guys. I negotiated a contract with several guys. Uh, Nothing came through. Uh, Nobody wanted to sign the contracts, and I don't know what they were. Of course, Usyk was saying that it was a contract that he didn't favor that much, but I think if Usyk really wanted to make that fight, the way he says he did, then he would have signed whatever contract was put in front of him. 
Devin Haney kind of showed that path that, I mean, he took a less money, uh, a lesser contract, traveled to Australia, and even signed a rematch clause that kept him in Australia for a rematch. And uh, maybe other guys should lead in that direction that if you take that opportunity, that chance, and then you prove yourself when that chance comes up, then the money's going to be there regardless, and uh, you become unified champion. I think Usyk should have found a way to make that happen, but I can't just blame Usyk and his camp. Uh, it's a two-way street. I don't know exactly what the terms were or who was getting what and who wanted what, but I would have liked to seen that happen over the in a way fight or in Ganway in 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 Ganway fight, whatever his name is. Uh, I don't know. I can't tell you anything about the UFC to be honest with you, so I don't know much about the guy. I know he's a big puncher, but I can tell you right now, he doesn't stand a chance in the ring. In the octagon, maybe. In the ring, no. I mean, it's just it's a completely different game. Uh, UFC fighters are prone to not moving their head, so Tyson will probably carry the fight for a good six rounds and then end up knocking, uh, knocking him out. So, wasn't happy about it, but at the same time, Saudi's over there throwing money at people, uh, like Halloween candy. So, I mean, I can't blame anybody saying, hey, I'm going to get my dollar. Uh, I'm going to get my money. I did hear that uh, Nganwe was getting $8 million for the fight. And I don't know if he's done his research into the type of money that Saudi is throwing out there. But I'm pretty sure Tyson's getting a lot more than that. And... If I'm and if I'm, uh, I'm I'm not saying eight million ain't a lot of money. It's it's hard to say, you know, pass on eight million dollars and he's never made that. He'd still made, you know, he made good. He made six hundred thousand. Uh, it's hard for me to relate when saying in sports in general only eight million dollars or only twenty million. That's eight million dollars. That that's a lot of money. So. Yeah, he's going to get paid, but I feel like, uh, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure he also has ticket sales, pay-per-view percentage, stuff like that, that's also going to make him uh, some extra money. Also, be the biggest payday of his career. I don't blame him for making this fight. Uh, I do blame boxing for allowing this to happen. Fury is an active fighter. To step aside and do an exhibition fight when you are a professional fighter, and wasting the time of boxing. Uh, this fight, there's nothing, what comes of this fight? Nothing, absolutely nothing. There's no belt involved. There's no, uh, there's there's nothing. I mean, it's an exhibition fight. So in all honesty, there's no winner or loser, even if, uh, you know, he gets knocked out. Uh, and Gagne, even if he gets knocked out, there's no winner or loser, supposedly in an exhibition but I just feel like it's a waste of time for boxing when bigger fights can be made. You know, the Usyk Fury fight. Now, I know Usyk signed on and he was fighting uh, Tobias. He fights him, uh, I want to say August or September. They signed on for that fight. And I get it. He moved on. But he didn't go decide he wanted to fight an MMA fighter. And, you know, he didn't go and approach the Ngannou fight. You know, Usyk didn't do that. He went and found another boxer who's a top 10 heavyweight and said, well, I'll give this guy a chance. Instead of playing stupid games of, well, I'm going to go fight this UFC guy just to entertain people. <clears throat> well, great, you're an entertainer. Then retire, give your belt up, and go be like Floyd Mayweather and a sideshow at this point because I feel like you're wasting boxing's time, man. And I can't believe the WBO is not finding this against him. I mean, they're basically saying that, you know, he doesn't have a mandatory. I get that. And he did apply negotiations. He wrote a letter to them pretty much saying, look, I, I tried to negotiate a contract with this guy, this guy, and this guy, and none of it went through. Uh, and... And like I said, it's on both parts. It's just not those guys didn't sign the contract. The contract wasn't signed by you also. So you're just as much responsible for not getting those deals done as the guys that you're blaming 
didn't get the deal done. And then you're going to go take this uh, sideshow fight when you're an active boxer right now. You're an active boxer. You didn't retire. Uh, you know, you claim to retire for 10 seconds, then you started talking. To, to me, you didn't. You never retired because you never relinquished your belts. You never turned your belts in. So you didn't officially ever retire, and you are an active fighter. <coughs> <clears throat> to me that's just I mean it's crazy to think that you know boxing is going to allow that to happen and that's where if you have a commission and uh, you have a committee and you have a boxing you know forum where this type of stuff comes up and you know they can say this fight can't happen you know you're an active fighter you can't take this fight but without i mean boxing's the wild wild west so fury can take this fight all day every day and boxing's going to allow that to happen and not much they can really do he's also earned that right i guess you can say he's a big time boxer he can pretty much do anything he wants fight anybody he wants and he doesn't have to explain it you know, he's felt that he's earned that right to do so, being one of the best in the uh, best in the industry. I'd say it's uh, Canelo and Fury are the two biggest names in boxing. As much as people don't want to admit Fury is, he is a big name. He is a big draw. Everybody wants to come out and see him. Can anybody beat this big six nine monster? I don't think so. And uh, that's uh, nobody. Usyk can't beat him. Uh, the size difference. And those guys will definitely end up being the big advantage towards Fury, who's going to use that to lean on him. He's not going to allow Usyk to be elusive and outmaneuver him and throw body shots on him. He's going to lean on him, he's going to punch on him, and he's going to wear him down and then eventually knock him out. That's how I see that fight going if he did fight Usyk. But now with this fight, like I said... My opinion was is that I think boxing should definitely take some action and not allow it to happen, but it's already going to happen. And they're pretty much saying, hey, we're going to allow it. He didn't have a mandatory, and he wrote us a letter stating that he tried to negotiate the contracts. Uh, instead of them stepping in and saying, okay, let's find you a mandatory. Let's find you a guy that is the number one contender outside of Usyk, who's second, who's third, who's fourth, whatever on that list that you can bring in and try to negotiate a contract with. Uh, but, like I said, that fight's going to happen. I'll end up watching it, of course. Uh, it is uh, Fury, so I'm going to end up watching it, but just not happy about it really, really happening. Uh, let's move on and look into the uh, Charlo, Jormel, or, J yeah, Jamel, there's Jamel and Jamal. Uh, Jamel did a video pretty much stating why he did not take the Canelo fight. He really didn't state why he didn't take the fight. He just used a lame-ass excuse that I got to get better. They say I got to get better. And he's out there drinking, talking about psychedelics uh, <clears throat> with the people in the background. I don't know what's what was going on there. But uh, he said he wanted to let his brother get some money. And once again, here's boxing just allowing this to happen. Uh, you know, this guy who hasn't fought in two years, you haven't taken his belts away from him. And he's on a live video. Man, like just really, really fucked up. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I think he was on some alcohol. And nothing wrong with drinking some alcohol. He was in the comfort of his home. He was with his friends. Maybe not a good time to always make a video when you're shit-faced drunk. I've learned that myself. Uh, you know, even with, you know, with bourbon and boxing, I now try to pace myself. I start out with a shot. I don't do several takes. Uh, when I first started, I, I'd, kept, I'd keep messing up and had to retake the shot from the beginning. So now I kind of pace myself to you know, time out when I take that shot. I don't want to be shit-faced on the show. I do enjoy bourbon and talking boxing, but I want to be coherent to the point where I know what I'm doing. Uh, <clears throat> but he went live, and he had a lot to say about just letting his brother take the fight, and that made me start thinking about Canelo. 
and is Canelo cherry picking? Because in my opinion, if Jermel was not able to take the fight for whatever the reasons are at this point, I don't think it's his broken wrist. Uh, I mean, I don't know what's going on with the dude, but he hasn't fought in two years. Uh, no real explanations on what is causing him not to get in the ring, but he decided to pass up the biggest fight of his life. The biggest fight of his life, and he thinks, well, I'll let my brother fight him, and then I'll fight him. It's not going to happen like that, bro. You're passing up this opportunity. You're not going to get another opportunity to fight Canelo. Uh, and I think the minute he decided that he, he pretty much declined the fight, instead of it, you know, well, I'm going to let my brother fight it. You know, I mean, I don't know how that works uh, when it's when he's two weight classes underneath uh, Canelo at uh, 154 and Canelo being at 168. And now you're going to let the smaller guy move up two weight classes, two weight divisions to fight Canelo, uh, the bigger guy, who obviously is going to be 170 plus when that fight starts. And Charlo Jamal is going to basically be struggling to make that 168 if that's a weight that he has to make. Uh, I don't know if they're going to have a catch weight agreement to where, you know, both fighters have a catch weight. Uh, Jamal comes up, Canelo comes down, uh, they fight for all the belts, you know, Charlo's belts and Canelo, Canelo's belt. I think that makes it a lot more interesting if they do decide, hey, we're going to, you don't, you could become the unified champion of 154 and 168 all in one night. That would be pretty cool. So if that was the case, if I'm Jamal, no, no doubt I'd take that fight if I could get it out of catch weight. But you're absolutely crazy to think if he doesn't get it out of catch weight, he's basically going to be hitting, struggling to hit the 168 mark, uh, Darren Waite, and then you know Canelo's going to come in, you know, maybe 10 pounds bigger, being the bigger fighter and putting uh, Jamal at a very big disadvantage in size. And then in that case, I see Canelo getting a knockout uh, on Charlo. And that's, not, you know, that's where I think, you know, I don't, I don't know. That's why I said I feel like he's cherry-picking Canelo, and that's not me dogging Canelo. But the fact is, is that Benavidez is out there. And if that fight with Jamel could not happen then you have to make the fight against Benavidez. And you have to make that fight happen because that, to me, is a huge fight. But I think Canelo doesn't want that fight. Uh, he's looking at everybody but Benavidez, almost as a slap in the face to Benavidez, saying, I'm going to fight who I want, and there's nothing you can do. Even if I'm in your same stable, I'm with the same company you are. I'll duck you and dodge you all I want and fight you when I decide I want to fight you. And I don't know if that's a message to Benavidez to back off and uh, he'll decide if he wants to fight him. But, you know, this is where boxing could step in and say, okay, we're not going to let this guy jump up two weight classes unless you guys can meet at a catch weight. Some type, some type of catch weight agreement. Uh, we're not going to let this guy jump up and fight you in a two weight division uh, thing. And then you know, skip out on the number one contender in Benavidez at uh, 168 uh, when the Charlo brother, Jermel, is not going to fight. The number one contender is not going to fight. So, to me, that's silly. Uh, and it makes me think Canelo is cherry-picking the smaller uh, fighter to try to, to try to get a big win uh, against a bigger name or to unify those belts uh, down at the 154 belt chasing of course but Benavidez has a belt if he wants another belt there's a belt there Benavidez has it and uh, he could fight him for that belt obviously but I think he's trying to just uh, hold that fight off as long as he can um, Benavidez may not get that until next year sometime uh, May of next year which what does he do now if you're Benavidez I think you got to take the David Morale fight uh, and that's a big risky fight because if you lose that, then you obviously lose the Canelo fight. You're not going to get that if you lose the David Morrell fight. So that is a big risky fight for him. So I could see him wanting to stay away from Morrell, but I think he got to stay active. If it's not Morrell, then you got to find somebody else that you can fight 
uh, in your weight division and uh, challenge yourself a little bit and while you're waiting for that Canelo fight. He's young, of course, he could wait a year, uh, but I really think that puts you at a disadvantage. You don't want to wait a year to fight Canelo if he if he already fought two times in that in that span. So who do you think is going to be more ready for that fight, Canelo or Benavidez? If Benavidez decides to wait out the rest of the year to get that fight uh, next year in May, he's at the disadvantage. He hasn't been in the ring. He'll have ring rust. Canelo is a more active fighter, fighting two times before that. Uh, so I think if you're Benavidez, be smart. Go set up a fight. Is it David Morrell? I want to see that. The boxing world wants to see that fight. I don't think it's the smartest fight for Benavidez as far as guaranteeing. I mean, if you want to show who you are, you take that David Morrell fight. And if you beat David Morrell, uh, there's there's no fucking doubt that Canelo has to fight you if you beat David Morrell. And I think if David Morrell beats him, then Canelo has to fight David Morrell. And I'm telling you right now, I think... Canelo doesn't beat Benavidez, and I don't think he beats uh, a David Morrell. Those guys are bigger uh, at that 168, and they're harder punchers, and uh, I think they would give uh, Canelo a lot of problems with the height, the size, and the punching power that they have. But <clears throat> Canelo's decided that, yeah, he'll let Jamal step in and fight him in September. I think September... 30th is uh, what I heard, which is kind of weird. I figured he would have fought on uh, Cinco de Mayo. Maybe I misheard that a little bit, but I did. I think I heard September 30th would be the date for that fight. Uh, but that pretty much is a majority of the boxing news uh, for the week for me. Uh, those three guys, of course, you know, uh, guys yakking back and forth. I don't really like to talk about the yammer. Uh, the yakking of guys who are talking to doing this and that. Uh, they'll fight this guy. They'll fight that guy. Uh, you'll see a lot of that on YouTube's guys. You know, oh, I'll fight this dude, and you know, and people paid a lot of attention. I don't really like to pay the uh, shit talking a lot of attention because it's just you know what boxers do. But uh, I did hear that Devin Haney got arrested for a gun charge in L.A. So I don't know what the outcome of that will be. Probably a fine. Uh, not sure what the laws are in uh, L.A., but he had a concealed weapon underneath the seat of his vehicle, which is against the law there. So that is also news on Devin Haney's part. <clears throat> I'm sure he'll get out of it. I'm pretty sure Dante Wilder just got the same charge uh, in L.A. back in a, a couple months ago. So uh, he seems to be doing okay. Doesn't seem to be a big... Uh, issue it's a gun he concealed it under a seat you just got to know what state you're in and what their laws are uh when you carry your weapons with you man so let's look into the fights coming up this week uh we got some good fights uh junior middleweight fight with uh josh kelly and gabriel corzo uh that's going to be july 5th check your local listings that's on the zone uh, it's going to be at the Virtue Motors Arena in Newcastle. And then Undisputed Super Featherweight Championship, Alicia Boomgarner versus Christina uh, Lindora. Uh, that's July 15th. Also, this Saturday, check your local listings. Also on the zone, uh, Manasonic Temple in Detroit, Michigan. Cuban amateur sensation Andy Cruz makes his pro debut. Uh, on that one, so check out that young guy, Andy Cruz, going to be making his pro debut de debut that day. Uh, WBC lightweight eliminator Frank Martin, the fight that I'm most looking forward to, versus Ardman uh, Hurachanen. Uh, that's July 5th. That's going to be 10 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, Showtime, Cosmopolitan, Las Vegas. The Showtime telecast will see the co-main event of top super middle or super lightweight contender Elvis Rodriguez meeting former world champion Victor Postal in a 10 round showdown hard hitting welterweight prospect uh, also in a showdown hard hitting welterweight prospect Fred Doris Rojas will take on Mexico's Diego Sanchez in a 10 round 
uh, telecast uh, opener. So it looks like uh, Showtime might be putting on a good card this week for us. Uh, uh, the Zone's got a uh, that Bumgarner fight, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, like I said, most looking forward to the uh, Frank Martin fight. I mean, he's another guy like Boots who uh, who's been in the who's been a prospect talk and. Uh, now he's ready for the uh, bigger fighters, and there's plenty of you know there's plenty of guys in that lightweight division for him to challenge. Uh, so I see this as an eliminator fight. Uh, so expect both of these guys to kind of come out and do their thing. But I think Frank Martin will put on a show this week, kind of do exactly what Boots did last week, send a message to the rest of the lightweight division that he's no longer the future. The guy up and coming, he is the now guy. Uh, he's ready now for Shakur, Javante Davis, uh, you know, a couple guys. He didn't really call him out. He was asked about those guys. Uh, a lot of outlets were saying that he was calling these guys out, but he wasn't. He was pretty much just, you know, asked, are you ready to fight Shakur? Are you ready for uh, Tank Davis? Are you ready for these top lightweights, Devin Haney? And he responded in a reasonable manner to say, yeah, I am. I, I think for sure I'm really ready to fight any of those level top guys right now. And I believe this week will be a good time uh, for him to really show that and give him an opportunity on a big stage uh, to showcase what he's going to do. But... I will also be tuning in for the uh, Elisa Boomgardner fight. I like her a lot. I've been following her since the very beginning of her career. And uh, I feel like she is absolutely on another level. She'll be fighting her girl who gave her her only loss in her professional career. And I think Elisa's going to come out and just dominate. She looks ripped, man. Uh, I follow her on Instagram. And she seems to be just a non-stop motor. She's in the gym. She's putting in the work. And she's getting better and better and better. And she's slowly becoming the face of women's boxing, uh, I think. And uh, you guys can call me crazy. I know Clarissa Shields is out there. I know Katie Taylor. Both of those girls are more closer to the end of their career. Uh, I know Alicia got started late, too, though. Uh, she is in her 30s, if I'm correct. Uh... So she is up there in age, but she seems to have, like, the fountain of youth or something, man. She uh, seems to be physically just getting better and better and improving her boxing skills. So to see her make her, I thought she was from Ohio, actually, and it looks like she is from the Michigan area. I think she trains and lives in the in Ohio, but... She is from Detroit, Michigan. I was uh, wrong on that. I thought she was an Ohio fighter, but I think she resides in Ohio, but will be going back home to uh, Michigan to make her home debut uh, this weekend. And that can be a lot of pressure on a fighter, going back home and then uh, having to deal with the pressure of being home in the home crowd and that you have to win or you have to put on a show. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the issue for Alicia, and I think she's going to come out and she's going to make a statement. Uh, against a girl who gave her only loss. So she's going to be hungry. And I think she's going to want to knock this girl's head off. And she is the type of p fighter that has that power. To where she could absolutely knock somebody out. And uh, so I, I expect her to put on a hell of a show. And a hell of a fight for us this weekend man. Uh, pretty much that is it for me guys. Uh, I don't have much more boxing news uh, that I can share with you. I uh, told you all the fights that went on last week and then also expressed the fights that are going on this week and uh, what I think about them and who I'm looking forward to. Uh, I guess watch the Cruise Kid, a uh, young guy like that. I'll give a shout out. That would be my young fighter shout out. Uh, my banger fight of the week. Uh, I think I'm going to go with the uh, Frank Martin fight. Uh, as much as I want to go with the Alicia Boomgardner fight against a girl who gave her her only loss. I think I'm going to lean towards the uh, Frank Martin fight. It's an eliminator fight, so these two guys are definitely going to come out banging and trying to tear each other's head off. Uh, before we go, man, let's take one last shot together. Like I said, tonight I am drinking on a fistful of bourbon, baby. It is some good stuff. I like it. It's uh, very smooth. 
and uh, we're going to take one more shot together before we call this episode three. Episode three, Fury's Fury. Episode three, let's wrap this up, man. Thank you guys for tuning in. I am your host, Jeff. Thanks for joining me for Bourbon Unboxing for another episode. And uh, thank you guys, anybody who is tuning in, man. Thank you. Leave comments. Talk boxing with me, man. I will definitely respond to you. Uh, I love to talk boxing. So uh, if you're looking to talk it, let's talk it, man. Let's get it on, buddy. Thank you, guys. This is my country, my damn country. Give me my country, you can keep the rest. This is my country, my damn country. And it don't mean a thing if it don't pass the test. If you ain't never cheated or been cheated on, then take off your boots, you rhinestone fraud. In your high school memories This is my country, my damn country Give me my country, you can keep the rest This is my country, my damn country And it don't mean a thing if it don't pass the test If you ain't never spent a single night in jail Then get it. another job and I'll see you in hell I'm drawn like a moth through the neon lights I need a bucket of beer and someone to fight No 